To a devout minority, the Sabbath is a day of worship, a day on which no unnecessary work should be done. But even the great cathedrals don't always attract big congregations. Though there are some churches which are nearly always full. The village church still remains one of the centres of Britain's country life. Yet it's estimated that although half the population officially belong to a church, only about one person in ten goes regularly. People disagree strongly about Sunday and how it should be spent. The opposition is organised and influential. The Lord's Day Observance Society believes firmly in the traditional Sunday and much, though not all, church opinion is behind it. To millions of people, perhaps the great majority, Sunday is the day for getting out and about. While most of the shops stay closed, the street markets in London do a huge business and are part of the Sunday scene. The national playgrounds are crowded, there's hardly room to move on the river, but a man can always moor up alongside and relax away from the mainstream if he wants to. That's the charm of Sunday. It can be spent to fit most moods. We live in an age of stress, and life in a big town or city is no rest cure. Today, 20th century blues, or what doctors call emotional illness, affect all sorts of people at some time or another. And it's partly due to the conditions in which we live and work, to this kind of thing. No wonder some people get jittery and nervous, excited or depressed. No wonder heads ache and hearts thump and blood pressure goes up. We live tightly jammed among a mass of restrictions, which in themselves can cause irritation. This Sixpenny Sentinel, for instance, and in the closely packed suburbs is the eternal fight to keep up with the Joneses. Doctors have a name for it. They call it suburban neurosis. Stress is part of the price we pay for progress as life gets faster and noisier. Some days you can almost scream. But stress builds up inside and what really gets people down is one unsolved problem on top of another. Look at this chap. A businessman may complicate his ordinary business worries by fears of the future. He may be too ambitious. He may worry about the chaps who are after his job. All this builds up tension, which can affect people in factories just as much as in offices, and which isn't left behind when he goes home. Many business executives are victims of tension, and here, in a castle, is one of the clinics which has been created to help them. Patients come from all over the country, from some of the 2,000 firms which have been invited to send their executives for rest and treatment. Inside the castle are all the appliances of modern treatment, for instance, the jet spray. The electric light bath can wind a man down and tone him up. This is the kind of bathing whose end product is health. Wonder what those blokes at the office are doing now. Well, there are worse ways of spending time, and foam bars never did those film beauties any harm. So much for the body, but what of the mind? Some people take the easy way out. They take pills. It's an incredible fact that in Britain today, we swallow more than a million happiness pills every 24 hours. We're spending on tranquilizers around six million pounds a year. These pills are meant to reduce tension without clouding the mind. Some students use them to get through exams, and motorists have been known to take them to settle those driving test nerves. But tranquilizers are open to misuse, and they don't remove the real causes of stress. While industry is beginning to look after its workers, nothing much seems to be done in the home, where stress can be just as acute. <laughs> stress, say the doctors, often starts in childhood, but it's not always the child on whose mind frustration leaves its impression. To any mother, 
The daily round of shopping, taking the children to school and looking after the family can sometimes become a bit overwhelming. Is it any wonder that some women find that they just can't cope? And here's a mixture for making what has come to be known throughout the world simply as the pill. Millions of words have been written for and against it. For this little white tablet is more explosive than dynamite. Sermons have been preached on it. Men and women have argued over it. It's the most controversial pill ever produced, and today it's being taken by nearly half a million women in Britain alone. Scientifically, it's a dramatic step forward in the control of nature. Marchers on London from Aldermaston are concerned with the biggest issue in the world today. Whatever the pros and cons of banning the hydrogen bomb may be, theirs is a protest which has brought together people from widely different spheres. Students and teachers, workers and bosses, they may regard themselves as forerunners of what is to come, the uniting of humanity itself. But in the meantime, humanity itself is divided about the safest way to get there. These voices will have to fill more of Britain than Trafalgar Square to change a country's mind. They're emphasizing the right of people to protest, to make themselves heard, whether other people listen to them or not. One of the exciting things about London is the astonishing mixture of races. Not a colour, a religion, a nationality is unrepresented. This has been so for centuries and the capital has never ceased to profit by it. What with their red guards and hydrogen bombs, the Chinese make a lot of noise in China, but in England they're usually the quietest immigrants of all. In the 50s there was scarcely a Chinese restaurant to be found outside the big cities. There are 20 today for every one a mere 10 years ago, and this spells a revolution in British eating habits. Half the fun of Chinese eating is having a go with the chopsticks. But if you want to really eat the Chinese way, you should make lots of noise, especially with the soup. It shows you like it. Strange how manners can differ. Noisy eating, yet no Chinese gentleman would dream of blowing his nose in public. Our debt to China is not only for food. Their art has enriched Western culture for centuries. Britain's Chinese, about 45,000 in number, many of very humble peasant origin, are remarkably law-abiding, cause the authorities virtually no trouble. Many are here without families, bent on saving enough to go back to Hong Kong and start their own businesses. Not all the Chinese in Britain are manual workers. At the other end of the scale, a fine house in Hampstead, property of shipowner P.Y. Shu. The shoes have been in England 17 years now. Completely integrated with English life socially and in business, they yet preserve at home the disciplined tranquility, the way of life consciously evolved over thousands of years that modern China has largely rejected. The first Poles to come to Britain Settled in Scotland in 1830, Vladislav Banashevich, a leather manufacturer, was one of the 60,000 more who came with the free Polish forces in 1940 after their country had been overrun. Today, only about 4,500 Poles remain in Scotland. Most of the community live in the south of England. Britain's principal Polish club is the Polish Hearth in South Kensington, which was started in 1940 as a centre for the free Polish forces. More Poles have settled in the Ealing area of West London than in any other part of Britain. Many have changed their jobs to make a living. 
Eating grocer Stefan Rozwadowski was once a textile engineer. Now he sells Polish food to Polish housewives and to some English ones as well. You'll find Poles in almost every walk of life in Britain today. Matthäus Grabowski, for instance, is a chemist with one of the most unusual chemist shops in the country. At the back of it, he has a gallery in which he displays the works of modern painters and sculptors who might not otherwise have exhibitions. Though most of Britain's Poles take a full part in everyday life, many of them keep up their national customs. Here, for instance, at the Polish Young People's Club in South Kensington, Olga Jeromska's dancing group performed traditional dances. Today, many young Poles would feel much more at home doing the twist. For although Britain's Poles will always be proud of their heritage, they are more interested in marching into tomorrow than in looking back to yesterday. Over the last 10 years, West Indians have been flocking into Britain. Today, there are some 350,000 of them living here, nearly half of them in London. Why do they come to this country? To find jobs and better opportunities. And because, as British subjects, they look on Britain as their second home. Their own homelands, 10 beautiful islands in the sun, which for 300 years have been part of the British Commonwealth and Empire, cannot provide work for them all in a rapidly increasing population. These West Indians were among the last to arrive at Southampton before immigration was controlled. At Waterloo Station, many were met by relatives and friends, but some had no one to greet them. Others had only addresses in Manchester, Birmingham or Leeds. To get them on their way, reception committees worked throughout the night. As most of the West Indies live by agriculture, the majority who've come to Britain are unskilled for industry, so jobs present a major problem. London Transport has a highly successful scheme which recruits bus conductors from Barbados, one of the West Indian islands. Candidates are chosen on the island, and some 200 of them come to Britain every year to join London's bus conductor force of more than 14,000 men and women. A day's outing, and it's raining. Britain's climate is something else that West Indians have to get used to. This party is off to Clacton-on-Sea. Eight thousand West Indians served in the British forces during the war, and about a thousand a year came to Britain just after the war. It was during the early 50s that immigration started in earnest, when 20,000 a year were arriving here, practically all men. But over the next five years, more and more women and children arrived to create a family pattern. They're essentially a simple, fun-loving people, and this sort of outing makes them forget their worries. For a few hours, they can escape the bewilderment of trying to adjust themselves to living in a world of different customs and different outlooks. Old prejudices die hard, and misunderstandings can become even more confusing. Though, if you're very young, your problems tend to be different.
25 years ago, not one father in 10,000 saw his baby born. Today, more and more fathers like to be there, especially at home. Accountant Fred Brown saw both his children's births. Buckinghamshire was one of the first counties to run mothers' clubs, held in the evenings when fathers can babysit. One of the lectures is on the dangers to children in the home, with special emphasis on inflammable garments. And non-inflammable materials. Meanwhile, father is finding some hazards too. Here, at one of Britain's only chain of combined mother and baby shops, she chooses an all-purpose suit that will stretch as the baby gets bigger. 29 of these shops have been opened in London in three years. It's amazing what you can get for babies these days. There's a bottle and teat that can be sterilized together. An example of how designers are concentrating on producing goods to make mothers' lives easier and save time. Bedford and Coventry. Glasgow, Oxford, Cambridge and Gloucester, Basildon and Bishop Stortford, London, Liverpool, Birmingham are just a few of the places where new city and shopping centres are changing the way of life for millions. The Bullring has been a flourishing trade centre for over a thousand years and is now probably the most advanced of its kind in the world. 23 acres of it under one roof, built at a cost of eight million pounds. Department stores, markets, supermarkets, a hundred shops, escalators to transport 150,000 people an hour. The problem of getting to and from the bull ring has been superbly solved. Ring motorways lead into car parks. Architects have striven to retain something of the character of the old bull ring. This poultry and fish market, for instance, where independent traders compete. And competition there really seems to be. Not many places will sell you chicken at one and tuppence a pound. sorts of household goods are nowadays weighed not just in pounds and ounces but in kilos and grams as well. It makes it simpler to market them on the continent. In these ways we are gradually getting used to new weights and measures without realizing it. Some goods, such as wine, are sold on a mixture of the two systems, the old and the new. And in places like Soho, many a shop will serve a kilo as casually as it'll serve a couple of pounds. The change is already starting. Although the beauty queens are still 36, 22, 36, it may be many years yet before they're 90, 55, 90 in centimeters, but luckily they'll still look the same. But the big change will be when we finally decide to go over to decimal coinage. For pounds, shillings and pence, with some units split into 12 and others split into 20, are a real headache for foreigners. So they are to everyone who isn't quick at figuring. A decimal coinage would do away with thruppenny bits and half crowns. Instead, we'd have a main unit like a pound and a cent. All so much simpler. Rubbish, refuse, 
garbage. Litter, trash, junk and scrap. Our instant way of living out of cans, bottles, bags and packets merely helps to aggravate the debris generated by our throwaway society. The waste we create in this routine living averages two pounds a day for every person in Britain. And every two or three hundred weight of it averages a cubic yard in size. On the shelves of stores and supermarkets throughout the country, thousands of commodities each have their own separate containers. Nearly everything we eat or use is wrapped in something, either a can, a bottle, a bag or a packet. Soon these containers are adding to the pile and the dustbin. Shall we burn it, grind it, pulverize it, take it to sea and sink it, or pile it up somewhere else? Refuse disposal is quite a problem, but to the resourceful ones, it's also an opportunity. Take waste paper, for instance. At the end of a pen pusher's day, there's an awful lot of paper in the basket. So after collection with all the other rubbish, it's sorted and bailed at the delivery center. So, collected, sorted, bailed, transported, Pulped, cleansed, sterilized, rolled, pressed, printed and stitched. Last week's letters, memos and wrappings have become next week's brand new cartons and containers. In a world where costs keep rising, we just can't afford to waste. But is there anybody who doesn't waste something? Dragon bone merchant with his horse and cart, his grotesque heap of junk, and his vociferous street cry is a fading scene. When mass production can so easily replace things, piecemeal collection and sale of junk offers little reward. Of the wares he collects, assorted rags are perhaps the most negotiable. After sorting, the cotton rags become industrial cleaning material, carpet felt and roof felt. For generations, families have roasted themselves around the living room fire, with most of the heat going up the chimney, by the way, and then frozen upstairs. Until recently, only two and a half million of the 17 million homes in Britain had any form of central heating. It's still a bit of a novelty, but it's catching on. And now 400,000 new installations are being put into homes each year to give all the year round domestic hot water supplies and a constant temperature in the rooms. At long last, the experts are being called in to provide a degree of comfort which used to be considered a luxury, if not downright immoral. Here, people can look at the various methods of central heating, electricity, gas, solid fuel, and oil, and get advice on which best suits their own needs. No less than a hundred million pounds is being spent annually on heating appliances and having them installed. Yet, unless the houses are efficiently insulated, and most of them aren't, one third of all the heat produced escapes through doors, windows, walls and roof. The surprising thing is that there are no official standards for insulating houses. Insulated homes manage on much smaller radiators and heat can be prevented from escaping through the cavity walls by filling them in. Some people put the sun to work. Large quantities of solar radiation still get through even on cloudy days in Britain. The same idea is being used on this Cheshire housing estate, where some of the houses are having solar panels fitted. They'll produce 30 gallons of domestic hot water a day by preheating it to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, and thus cut down on fuel bills. 
this well-insulated school at Wallasey in Cheshire has no central heating. And for several years now it's had no heating bills either. It's the first school in Britain to be heated by solar radiation. With the cost of fuel still going up, you'd think the problem of wasting heat ought to be a matter of national importance. We can't really afford to go on warming up the sky.